This is a short video about algebraic and order properties of the real numbers. So, um, you know, the set of real numbers will denote it by this um, bold-faced R here. It's got kind of your usual operations of addition and multiplication. So like how you learn to add and multiply numbers, and for that matter, subtract and divide since, you know, negative numbers are real too. Those are all uh, fair game here for this class. And you can take reciprocals of non-zero numbers, all that good stuff. And by uh, order properties, just how something like a less than or a greater than works. So like when you, um, you know, divide both sides of an inequality by a negative number, that things should flip around. That kind of stuff is all, all fair game. So um, to get into some of the other interesting properties that we'll be using a lot, one result that we'll need is there's no such there's no smallest positive real number. So another way to say that is that the set of reals, it's not well ordered. So how would you prove such a thing? This is where something like a proof by contradiction might come in handy. So by way of contradiction, that's what this BWOC means. Let's suppose that there was some real number A that is the smallest positive real number. Well, wait a minute. What if you just took half of that? Well, one half of A is still a real number. Uh, it's still positive since you just multiplied it by a half. And it's even smaller than A was. So that's your contradiction. Boom. Done. Another interesting property of the real is that we'll be using often. If A is a real number such that A is between 0 and epsilon for every positive number epsilon, then A itself has to be 0. So in other words, what this is trying to say is if A is arbitrarily close to 0, that is another way to say this part here, then A has to be 0. So why should that make sense? Like, this is pretty crazy, right? If we're saying that I've got zero here and for any distance epsilon away from zero, yep, A is in here. If you could do that for any epsilon, uh, this thing, you could just shrink it closer and closer to zero so that yes, that point A has to just be zero. So that's kind of the intuition for what this says. So how do you actually prove it? And again, we'll use that yellow result. Kind of a case of a, a proof by contradiction. So let's see, I've got to hit these. So by way of contradiction, let's say that you had A, and let's say that it's greater than zero. Well, what if you took epsilon to be just one half of A? Well, that's still a positive number. And by the way, I added the subscript here to epsilon just because it's a specific one of these epsilons here. So we'll notice that this is an epsilon that satisfies this assumption that it's positive. That's all I'm saying to you here. So therefore, what should I have? By hypothesis here, uh, I should have that uh, A should be smaller than epsilon naught. And that's what this says here. But if you actually plug in what is epsilon zero or epsilon naught, like I just said, that says that A is smaller than half of A, which is ridiculous. That's your contradiction. So another um, you know, key property of the reals that we might run into is the geometric mean inequality. So if you've got two positive numbers, A and B, positive reals, then the left side, square root of a times b, is the geometric mean, and that's always smaller than the arithmetic mean, which is just a plus b divided by two. And the only time that this is an actual equality is when a and b are the same number. So how would you prove this thing? So the first thing that we'll do, let's suppose that a and b are distinct. Well, then when you take their square roots, those are distinct as well. So that means, or what else can I say? I know that any, if, if a and b are distinct, well, then I know that their difference is, is definitely non-zero. And when you square that difference, a number squared is always positive is what this says. So what we'll do is if I'll foil out the left side, and that's a minus two times square root of a b plus b is greater than zero. And then now we will just add this over to the other side and divide by two. And then we've got our geometric mean inequality. So it's definitely true when a and b are not the same number. So what do we need to do? We need to show that equality happens if and only if a is equal to b. So let's do that. So if a is equal to b, then when you take the square root of a times b, that's really a squared if these are equal. So the square root of that is just a. Similarly, if you look at a plus b over two, if a is equal to b, then this is just two a over two. Well, that's just a as well. So what am I saying to you? you get the same thing, you get an equality. So what we've just done is one direction of this if and only if, and now what we'll do is we will suppose that the actual uh, equality holds here and we'll try to show that A and B have to be the same. So if you had an equality for two numbers, for potentially two numbers A and B, we'll show that it's not two numbers, then what we'll do is I'll just multiply both sides by two and then I would bring this to the other side, that's this right here, and then this thing will factor like I did before, 
And what have I got then? Well, I know that uh, for real numbers, right? If the square of a real number is zero, well then the inside has to be zero. Therefore, square root of a has to be square root of b. And so a has to be b, it has to be the same thing. All right, the last one uh, for this section that we might need is Bernoulli's inequality. And what's it say? If x is just bigger than negative one, then one plus x to the nth power will be larger than one plus n times x for every single natural number n. And whenever you've got to prove something like this for every natural number n, that is when you use a proof by induction. So this will be a refresher on how does induction work. So let's just fix, you know, x to be larger than negative one here. So for induction, remember there's a base case. Well, we're doing this for natural numbers n. So the first one I'll pick is let's let n equal one. So when I plug in one for the n's here, just look at what that says. That says one plus x to the one, that's definitely equal to one plus x. So Bernoulli's inequality is true when n equals one. Now let's do the inductive hypothesis. So we're gonna suppose that one plus x to the k is equal to one plus kx for some natural number k. And remember, we need to show that this is also true when I change these to a k plus one. I need to show that. So what we'll do is, why don't I start with this side with k plus one power, and uh, what I'd like to do, remember what you're always trying to do in an induction proof is to manipulate it so that you can use the induction hypothesis to help you out. That is like your, your foothold. So what we'll do, I see that I can get a one plus K out of this if I just use some exponent rules. So I'll factor off a one plus X off of that. And then now I can apply my induction hypothesis to that piece. Uh, sorry, this should also be a, uh, a um, less than, oops, yeah, just like, or sorry, other way around, <laughs> goodness gracious, it should go this way, sorry about that, so that is a typo on my part, but this is still inequality, and then now it will do, so maybe we could just write it from there, by the induction hypothesis, we could say that this is larger than or equal to uh, one plus kx times one plus x, and uh, what we'll do is we'll multiply that stuff out. So that would be one plus, I would get uh, x plus kx. So that would be uh, one plus k times x. And then plus the last two would give you just kx squared. And uh, what have I got then? This is definitely larger than or equal to if I just deleted this term. So one plus one plus k times x. And why would I do that? Because I see that now one plus x to the k plus first power is, is bigger than or equal to one plus one plus k all times x. And that would be the end of that induction proof.